This video is going to look at sports policy and the sports environment. Uh, this is the second dot point for what role do preventative actions play in enhancing the well-being of the athlete. The syllabus for sports policies and the sports environment requires us to have a look at sports rules and activities, how those rules are then modified for children, uh, the matching of opponents in sports, uh, the use of protective equipment within sports, and then also the safe grounds, equipment, and the facilities that are used around sports. Now, with that information, what this will ask you to do is to critically analyse sports policies, rules, and equipment to determine the degree to which they promote safe uh, participation. Rules of sport and activities. So rules in sport and any kind of other physical activity are always there uh, to promote engagement in the game. They're there to promote safe and fair play, uh, but essentially they're there to make sure that they look after the athlete who's playing that sport. So um, there are so many different rules that exist within games, uh, most of which uh, we don't really think about most of the time. Uh, so rules cover things from the size of the field, so you know, how big is a soccer field, how big is an AFL field, how big is a netball court, how big is a court allowed to be for futsal, uh, how big is a volleyball court, how high is the net, all those kinds of things are rules of the game. Uh, we then have things like fouls, so you know, are you allowed to tackle, slide tackle, uh, are you allowed to uh, coat hang in them, what rules exist within the game uh, to, in, order to, in terms of what constitutes a foul in terms of foul play. Uh, it also is going to include how uh, scoring is done. Uh, now scoring generally is about uh, increasing participation and stuff rather than promoting well-being. Uh, but that's just part of what the rules cover. And then also how long breaks are and how many breaks uh, might exist within a sport. So you might notice that uh, in a sport like AFL, there's actually uh, three breaks throughout the game. So the game's broken into quarters. Uh, whereas when it comes to something like um, ice hockey, ice hockey is broken into three different periods. Uh, football or soccer is broken into two halves, same as rugby league and stuff. Um, futsal is also broken into two halves, netball is broken into quarters. Uh, generally it has to do with the intensity of the sport um, and what kind of environment they're being played in. Uh, so the breaks are definitely there to promote the well-being of the athlete because if they're doing a really high intensity sport for too long without getting access to water or a chance for their body to kind of recover before they keep going, uh, then they become tired and then more likely to have injury. Uh, and the same for the size of the field, if they have to cover too much area, um, how many players are on that field. Uh, are there, you know, if you had 11 players on a futsal court, for example, uh, you're actually going to have a lot higher rate of injury because there's so many people in quite a condensed area. And that's why we have rules where uh, the field has to be large, 11 against 11, and then in futsal it's only 5 against 5, uh, to make sure that you're less likely to run into each other and injuries are less likely to occur. Those rules then get modified for children. So all sports essentially are going to change their rules for uh, children and young athletes. And that's essentially uh, both to promote safety, but also to do further promotion of participation. So in order to promote safety, uh, our children and young athletes, they're going to have shorter games. They're going to have more breaks. Um, they're going to probably use um, softer equipment. So for example, in cricket, uh, if you think of kanga cricket, which is often what they do uh, for primary school in sport and stuff, we're looking at plastic stumps, plastic bats, um, plastic balls uh, that are kind of squishy that they hit. Um, and then uh, they're also going to have rules that are really about promoting participation as well. So they're going to rotate through, everyone gets a bowl, everyone gets to bat. Um, for a certain number of overs and stuff and so it's really just about like, giving everyone a go and making sure everyone's having fun uh, and in allowing them to engage in the sport uh, but yeah so we modify the rules for children and for young athletes essentially things get shorter they get smaller as well so you know, your cricket field is smaller your soccer field is smaller um, you're going to have a more uh, a break in the middle still or maybe more breaks depending on what kind of sport it is uh, you're also probably going to make sure that a lot of those games are timed to play early in the morning or earlier in the day where it's not quite so hot. It won't go for as, um, anywhere near as long, particularly for cricket. You know, kids' cricket is not going to go for five days. Um, instead, they're going to play games that last about uh, two hours uh, so that they actually are still maintaining some kind of safety and health and are not required to be out in the sun for that long or all kinds of stuff. 
And then come to matching of opponents. So a lot of sports uh, match opponents and there's so many ways that you can match opponents. Uh, and so each sport tends to pick the best method that is, suits their particular sport. So a lot of combat sports, for example, will match people by size. Uh, but combat sports will also match people by age and their skill level as well. Most sports uh, will do things by age. So, uh, you know, you think of soccer done by age, AFL, pretty much every single sport you are divided up by age and then you're divided up um, often by skill level would be the next thing. So what division are you in or what belt uh, are you in if it's a combat sport or something? And so, you know, uh, someone who plays in seventh division uh, is at a lower skill level than the person who's playing at first division uh, and that will then allow the matching of uh, opponents to help reduce uh, the number of injuries. We also are going to do things by sex. Uh, not to be sexist, but generally speaking, uh, males, because of their testosterone levels, are larger and stronger, uh, and that means that in order to um, promote safety for our female athletes. Uh, and so often in sports, uh, they will use a combination of all these. Uh, when you take something like netball, they're going to do things mostly by age and skill level. Um, and the same for soccer, age and skill level. Uh, and the same for Rugby league, although it is very debated these days in rugby league, whether or not they should also bring in um, matching of opponents by size because they often, uh, particularly with our influx of islanders uh, who now live in Australia, uh, the younger islanders, uh, they grow a lot faster. They tend to reach uh, be a lot bigger than uh, our non-islander populations. And so is it actually safe for them to be playing against each other even though they're the same age and particularly the same skill level, their sheer size uh, can make it dangerous for the younger kids who are trying to tackle them. Uh, so the matching of opponents is done to promote safety, to reduce uh, the risks of injury. A lot of sports use protective equipment. Now, most protective equipment is worn by athletes. So, you know, in ice hockey, your goalkeeper, for example, is going to have helmets, gloves, pads. Uh, he's going to have the works. He's got his stick. He's got all kinds of stuff, a great over his face. Uh, a little thing that hangs down to protect his neck. He's, uh, he's going to have everything to make sure that he's nicely uh, protected uh, through his equipment because he's someone who's going to have pucks hit at him all the time at high velocities. Uh, and if he doesn't have the padding, he's more likely to get injured. Uh, we also have um, a protective equipment that is used by athletes. So this is really about using the correct size equipment. So the correct size balls and bats and stuff uh, for your athlete. But particularly like you think in cricket, if there wasn't a bat, uh, then they're more likely to get hit. Uh, so giving them a bat and then giving it to them at the right size means that they're less likely to get hit by the cricket ball that's bowled at them. And then there's other things that come in uh, to the use of protective equipment as well. So things like the high jump mat, uh, padding that's put around posts in rugby league or in netball uh, to make sure that when athletes run into those metal posts, they're not going to actually get a direct injury as a result of that. Well, hopefully not. Uh, if they do, it's at a lesser um, intensity than it would have been if there hadn't have been the padding around it. Uh, in ice hockey, for example, to uh, those goals that are in ice hockey, if you hit them, they actually will pop out and slide. Uh, they're not rigid. You're not going to hit it and then stay there. They actually move around uh, because that promotes uh, safety within the sport. And then when we come to safe grounds, equipment and facilities. So in terms of our grounds, we want to make sure that our ground that we're playing on, whether it be a court, a field, whatever it happens to be, is kind of flat, uh, is non-slip. Uh, you don't want, you know, if it's been raining and you're playing netball outside on some concrete or something, you're not going to be playing probably after rain because the ground becomes really slippery and you're more likely to have injuries and so often uh, games will be called off. Uh, if you're inside and you're playing volleyball or something and the ground gets wet, normally it gets dried up before you continue because otherwise that's too dangerous and uh, you're more likely to injure yourself. Uh, it can become an issue with flat grounds, like for soccer or stuff, often grounds are quite bobbly and bumpy. Uh, so to a, a limited extent that's alright, but if there starts to be really big potholes and stuff around the place, uh, it can then become too dangerous and athletes become more likely to roll their ankles. Uh, it'll also include checking to make sure there's no broken glass, syringes, all that kind of stuff, making sure that the ground uh, is safe for um, participation to occur on it. Uh, and then we go to equipment, like I mentioned, making sure it's the correct size. You can see here in our little cricket kid uh, that his gear is actually too big for him. He can't really lift and move that bat, plus he's got a whole bunch of other stuff going on there. 
uh, you want to make sure that what they're using is the correct equipment for them. Uh, so a little person, you should use smaller equipment because it's lighter, easier to maneuver. Whereas a larger person may then choose to use a bigger size bat uh, in cricket, for example, so that they get uh, they can reach the ground, less likely to get hit on the toe, they're more likely to stop the ball hitting the stumps too, uh, and all that kind of stuff. So making sure that they have the correct equipment. And that correct equipment doesn't just mean you know sticks, bats, balls. It also uh, is going to include their clothing. So you want to make sure their clothing actually allows breathing, allows air to flow through to help uh, remove any heat that's being produced while that person's performing, uh, that allows them to still run uh, in their performance and stuff. So it's very important that their equipment is the correct size and also allows airflow and stuff so that they can move uh, and also maintain their body temperature. And in terms of our facilities, our facilities is going to include the kind of surrounds of the grounds. So that's going to be um, you know, your grandstand if there's one, your toilets if there's one of those, uh, your fences that are around fields and stuff. Uh, you want to make sure that there's some kind of shade, uh, particularly if it's something like cricket or AFL where the game's going to go for an extended period of time. You want to make sure that there's some kind of shade, particularly for spectators or for the uh, team who are going to be sitting out waiting their turn to bat or whatever. Make sure that they're not in the sun all day. Uh, you want to make sure that those toilets work, that they're functional, that there's no glass in them, that they're safe and clean, and also that there's some kind of water available because uh, you don't want to run out of water and then not be able to go and fill up somewhere. So making sure that there is some kind of water available at the facilities then allows that uh, facility to be safe and to promote the well-being of the athlete. Now, it recommends in your Learn 2 that you consider particular uh, rules or equipment for particular sports uh, and critically analyse them. So here with the Rugby Union uh, Scrum Rules, we're going to do a quick little analysis of that for you. So uh, back in the 1970s and 1980s, there was an enormous amount of neck injuries during Scrum, uh, and this research is based uh, on Australian uh, Rugby Union games that were played. So lots of neck injuries, uh, and it then became an issue, and uh, be people started to protest and say that you know, something needed to change within the sport. Uh, and so in the 1985 to 1990, it was uh, the crouch, touch, pause, engage rule was introduced into the scrum. And we actually found that that reduced spinal injuries in scrums in Australia by 67%, uh, which is a massive reduction in spinal injuries. So the introduction of that rule basically just kept, uh, it allowed the referee to take more control uh, of the scrum and to make sure that the production of force was uh, done at the same time as the scrum came together to engage. So they crouched, they would touch each other, they would have a brief pause before they then uh, pushed into each other uh, and started the scrum. Whereas before that, they would just crouch and then push uh, and most of the time the ref would just go, okay, go. Uh, and you'd see the scrums come together, whereas uh, with this rule, that slowed down, which then meant that there was uh, better control in when the, how the athletes came together, which resulted in a reduction in our spinal injuries. And of course, uh, that rule since got introduced to um, international rugby and stuff and has now been changed again. <laughs>